The following is an exclusive panel, a deeper discussion. A special presentation of First Coast News on your side. Voices of bravery, honoring the veterans of Vietnam beyond the battlefield. Joining us in studio are veterans of the war in Vietnam. Dow Peters, United States Marine Corps. During our discussion, Mr. Peters explains why he felt he was fighting three wars wrapped up in one. Klaus Maurer, United States Marine Corps. Mr. Maurer grew up in Germany. His father was forced to fight for the Nazis during World War II. Today, you'll hear why he volunteered to fight in Vietnam as a United States Marine. Quang Pham, United States Marine Corps a refugee of South Vietnam who came to the United States as a child in 1973. He is the author of A Sense of Duty, Our Journey from Vietnam to America. Mr. Pham is the first Marine Corps pilot of Vietnamese heritage in U.S. history and flew missions in the Persian Gulf War and Somalia. Why he says he owes his life and freedom to all of the veterans of the Vietnam War. Gary Newman, United States Navy. Mr. Newman is well known for helping Vietnam veterans, especially those serving terms in prison. He served two tours of duty in Vietnam and served aboard the USS Maddox during the now famous Gulf of Tonkin incident. You'll hear exactly what happened on that day. William Carandis, United States Marine Corps. Known as Combat, Mr. Carandis served in Vietnam from 1968 to 1970 as a machine gunner. His experience in combat during the Vietnam War is extensive and as a recipient of the Vietnam Gallantry Cross, individual citation. And Al Hayes, United States Army. Mr. Hayes is a decorated combat soldier. His experiences living the grunt life will reinforce that Vietnam was no conflict. It was a war. Also joining us is Dr. Michael Butler, professor of history at Flagler College in St. Augustine, Florida. Dr. Butler is an expert on the Vietnam War. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Jeannie Blaylock of First Coast News, and welcome to our bonus Vietnam content. We are getting such tremendous feedback on our new documentary, Voices of Bravery, honoring the veterans of Vietnam. And so now, let's talk more about Vietnam. We are honored to have our panel members here today and I told them, didn't I tell you guys, just be yourself, be raw, be honest, say whatever you want. We want to hear from you, so don't hold anything back. And our historian, Dr. Michael Butler, is going to kick things off. Dr. Butler. Thank you so much, and thank you, panel, for uh, being here and answering the questions in light of the documentary. And you know, one of the questions that I get from students, one of the questions I know that you guys get as you appear at the schools and talk about the role that you played during the conflict is, did we lose the war? If you Google the first war America lost, Vietnam pops up. Did we lose or is that not the right question to ask? So let's start to my left with combat. You know, that's a good question. Uh, trying to uh, find out whether we did or did not lose. There's so many, so many controversies about that, but we walked out on Vietnam. So what's that say? I don't know. How do you evaluate losing and winning? We killed 10 times more of the enemy in Vietnam than they killed the American soldiers. So nobody can ever say we lost the war. Uh, I personally feel we won the war. We were there for years and years. We have 58,000 Americans killed helping the South Vietnamese. So we definitely didn't lose the war. We were there for them to help them. Mr. Newman. My opinion is that uh, as a military man, I, I feel that we won the war militarily. But what we lost uh, was the fire in the gut of our American people. They weren't behind us. Mm -hmm. Our government wasn't behind us. But the military man was willing to still go out on the battlefield and uh, exchange his life for the potential freedom of others. And, Mr. and I Fram think that's what's important. Yeah, and Mr. Fram, you hear people say all the time, well, we walked out, we walked out on Afghanistan, we walked out on Vietnam, and, and being from South Vietnam and growing up there and having family there, even your dad in prison, does that, are you mad about that or? Uh, no, I, I, I'm not mad about it. I'm frustrated because how the war was portrayed, leaving the, the South Vietnamese out of the discussion and 
you know, I went from being a war survivor as a kid to a refugee in America and to being an American citizen and a U.S. Marine, so I'm very grateful and blessed that I survived the war, and I'm very grateful that America took my family in. As far as who won or lost, I'm in America. The style of Vietnamese lost the war. The United States did not lose the war. Mm. The United States quit in Vietnam, and that in itself has bothered this country and an entire generation um, since the, the last Americans left Vietnam in the 70s. And talking about that 12 million figure. Yeah, percentage-wise, if the United States lost the same percentage of our population that the Vietnamese did, we would have over 12 million names on the Vietnam Memorial. So the question of who won and who lost is hotly debated and it's often very personal. Klaus, did win, lose, or wrong question? Uh, I say uh, most battles we all won. We, I say we like uh, walked out on South Vietnam. I, did, I didn't like to see it how it ended. And I think the other thing what we did wrong was that we, whenever we had a battle, we never conquered that piece of land. Mm -hmm. We kept on walking through, and then three days later, you went to the same area again and fought the same battle over and over again. And I think, you know, like World War II, when they conquered uh, ground, they left people there so nobody could come behind. So in my opinion, uh, that was one of the mistakes we made over there. We fought a lot of battles 10 times. We didn't have to if we stayed foot there. Mm. Mr. Fram, you've been talking about the amount of military equipment that was there available. Yes, the, uh, the United States, uh, from a military uh, perspective, uh, dropped three times the amount of uh, bombs in Viet on Vietnam in Laos and Cambodia, and it did in World War II combined in the uh, Asia and the European theater. Um, we landed over 550,000 American troops in 1968. We had the Air Force, we had the Marines, we had the Army, um, we had the Navy, uh, we had carrier support aircraft, we had B-52s, and then we armed the South Vietnamese with the fifth largest Air Force in the world. So it was not a civil war. It was not a skirmish, it was a full-blown war um, for over a decade. Does it irritate you when people call it the Vietnam conflict? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. It was a war. It was definitely a war. We had pilots that got shot down, went to a place, LBJ, Long Bend Jail, in jail for years and years before they finally got released. It was definitely a war. And with me being a grunt out there on the front line, I know personally it was a war. How's that? Oh, God. Helicopters take six of us out to the jungle. There's a line of helicopters, and they hover because the vegetation is so thick they cannot land flat, so they hover. You got everything in your back that you're going to live in the jungle with for a whole year. Your, your, your sea rations, your, your ammunition, your four canteens, all the stuff you need to, uh, until the helicopters come back and resupply you again. So it was definitely a war, and we're out there on patrol getting shot. And when you watch one of your buddies, most of us are 19, 20, and 21 years of age. And when you watch one of your buddies get shot, I mean, you just cry about it. Because where you're standing at is your bathroom. And your buddy is watching you while you got a little entrenching tool. It's like a little shovel that you have on your band here. And you dig a little hole, and he's watching to make sure the enemy doesn't come up while you are using the bathroom. And at night, Somebody's going to have an hour guard duty and wake the next person up because if everybody went to sleep in the jungle, we all get killed, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it, it was definitely a war. Uh, when you see young people like that get killed, they love America and they're on the front line. And, and I guess uh, those are the best friends I ever had because we shared things. We, we exchanged sea rations. We had what you call C4. It's a little white uh, flammable thing that you can warm your water with up and warm your food up with. And we shared everything. And, uh, and like I said, when you see one of your buddies get shot, it just hurts you so bad because it could have been you. It might be you later on. So I've, it was definitely you, a war. Al, I've heard you say it was the worst year of... Oh, worst year of my life. Uh, that year I spent in Vietnam jungle. Can you imagine sleeping in the rain, uh, digging a little hole, 
the mortars come in, we got a long machete, we chop trees down, dig a hole, and put the limbs across the top of it. But the monsoon is off and on. He's from Vietnam, he knows about it. Rain for one hour, stop, the sun is out again, your feet are wet. My feet are still bad today from that. And, and you, you cross in rivers, a lot of times the rivers above your head, we had a uh, little inflation tools that we can blow up because uh, you can't let your weapons get wet. Your mm -hmm. weapons and ammo get wet, you, you're not even in war no more. <laughs> so we blow that little inflation tube up, put our you know, guns and ammunition on that and let it float across. And you know, you swim behind it, get across the river and everything. And so, uh, like I said, it's, uh, it just made me feel like I can accomplish anything when I love Vietnam. Uh, any job I get now doesn't even bother me because I think about Vietnam and it was the worst year of my life. Watching my buddies get shot, me getting shot through my canteen, and I just said, thank God I didn't die. But uh, as I get closer to Memorial Day, which is next weekend, end of the month, my eyes get wet because I got buddies on that wall downtown, and I got buddies uh, at 58,000, and next to me, as close as you are, and we're on ambush, and I think I showed everybody civil stock after Vietnam, and it just makes me sad. I'm sad right now, even thinking about it. Well, that's one of the reasons I think that veterans get so upset when they're told it wasn't a war, it was a conflict or it was a military action. Um, the year that you just described can be uh, characterized as nothing but a war. Um, however, I heard Dow was one of the first people who said, yes, it bothers me. What's your experience with the differentiation between a war and a conflict? And why would you characterize it primarily as a war, Mr. Peters? What was your well, experience? Well, I was fighting three wars, uh, which I've told you. Uh, one for my country and the Vietnamese, which I thought I was there protecting their freedom. Um, two, um, the uh, war to stay alive. And three, the race war, because I had to prove to the guys around me, which was from Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia, that I was a person just like them. And I had their back just like they had my back. And so tell us an example, maybe an example of where you had to deal with racial tension in Vietnam during a war. Well, one evening some uh, Marines came in out of the field. They'd been out there for 30 days and my clothes were falling off of them. They were hungry, tired, and that night we had to stay on guard duty. So it was two men to a foxhole. And um, I, I heard this one Marine crying, and I asked him, man, what is your damn problem? And he says, my father said, I'm from Alabama. My father told me not to trust you blacks. And uh, I said, why? Uh, you guys fall asleep. I said, no, I'm not going to fall asleep. Not only will you die, I'm going to die too. And so I took his guard duty, trying to be nice so he'd get a full night's sleep. The next morning he wakes up and he's screaming and hollering that I had fell asleep. and got the sergeant and the guard and the lieutenant, everybody down there. And um, I explained to him what I had done and why I did it. And um, they looked at him and said, well, he took your guard duty so you can get some sleep. So. Always, always a battle, no matter what. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for explaining that, but sorry you had to go through all that. <laughs> One of the things that Mr. Kwong mentioned that I think is very true when talking about the Vietnam War is that where you were, what you did, and when you were there makes a lot of difference in how we discuss the experiences that each of you had. So what I would like to do is starting with combat and maybe go around, can you tell us what your role was, where you were stationed, and the years that you were actually in country? And whether or not you enlisted or you were drafted, because that adds to the different experience that combat veterans had. I enlisted in the Marine Corps at 17, turned 18 in boot camp. I was in the Marine Corps from 68 to 74. When I got to Vietnam, I was stationed with the 1st Motor Transport Battalion, 1st Marine Division, and I was a convoy gunner, and I was a night sniper. We took our, uh, we, took, we went out on convoys, and, and like these gentlemen were saying, watching your buddies get killed, when you see a truck hit a 500-pound box mine, and there's troops in them and stuff like that, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a mess. I mean, uh, you know, you, you, the 
be us being the the wrecker, we pushed it off out of the way. We took what we could take and, and they removed the bodies and then a Sherman tank that was behind us would run over it. And but we were I was in Danang, Chula, Fubai, and Walt Crane Tree, Hill 55, 37. I did night snipes off of 320, uh, 327, Hyvon Pass. So I was, I did everything. I was. Uh, and if I could just ask one question, something I know that you were telling me that I think everybody here can relate to, but I wanted you to share. Do you mind sharing about being on the airplane, coming to the airport, and your and your dad? Well, when we got home, I mean, it was it was. It was okay when we landed at Travis. When we left Travis, went over to LAX. I mean, it was horrendous. Uh, we were treated awful, spit on, yelled at, called names, and stuff like that. And I slept three days in the airport before they even let me get on a plane. Uh, once in I, Travis or LA? Travis. Travis Air, No, no, in LA. LA LAX. Okay. Uh, when I did get on a plane and did go home, all the way from from California to Indiana, it was it was nothing but pure. Brutality. I mean, people spitting on you, throwing stuff at you, calling you baby killers, and you were you were you were nothing. You you were losers and stuff like that. And and when we landed in uh, Indianapolis, Weir Creek Airport, I got off. I came off the plane, got up the, the the walkway, and walked into the to terminal. When we got in there, all I heard was booze and baby killers and being spit on and stuff like that. And I saw my dad about 10, 15 feet in front of me. I thought, okay, my dad's here. Things are going to be, things are going to be okay. I walked up towards my dad, and I saw my dad just back up into the crowd and left me standing there. And uh, I caught up with him, in, uh, caught up with him going down the, down the uh, walkway. And I said, Dad, I said, why did you walk away from me? He says, Well, you know, I don't want to hear all that stuff. I said, Well, I said, you can at least give me a hug or welcome me home. I said, You didn't even do that. I said, What is going on? You know. And, uh, it was like uh, it was like coming into uh, some place that you you don't know you don't recognize you're 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 there you're there by yourself you're in a you're in a dark box and and you don't know which way to go mm. what happens and then when you got home you weren't allowed in your home no when we we got home uh, I couldn't I couldn't live there I couldn't come there uh, and so how'd you eat uh, well I had a sixty five Ford station wagon that I lived in. And I used to go to uh, some of the bakeries that would throw away their food and stuff like that, or restaurants, and eat out of the dumpsters and uh, sleep in the back of that station wagon. So, and what, the food in the dumpsters was from a local. Well, you know, at Roslyn Bakery, they would throw away all their stuff. They would clean off their shelves, and every night they throw their stuff away. So some of the some of those grocery stores and stuff, you would go back there and you find cans of food and stuff. You know, so that's how I lived for about three years. And for all of us who are not veterans, and if you're if you're listening right now, I mean, it's, it seems so minimal to say thank you for your service. And and as somebody from your situation, what do you tell these veterans? I mean, I'm sure. I mean, they've given their lives, they've given their friends, uh, and you were in our U.S. military. But what are your thoughts when you hear him say that? Well, uh, uh, like I said, I, I'm very blessed. Of all the three million Vietnamese that died in the war, and uh, almost sixty thousand Americans, and all those who suffer from wounds and PTSD and Agent Orange. Uh, I feel very fortunate to be less, part of the less than 1% that got out during the fall of Saigon. I was 10 years old, grew up in Saigon. My father was a Vietnamese Air Force pilot. My mother was a uh, school teacher, had three sisters. Very blessed to be in America, very grateful. Like I said, these veterans went not to fight for America. To me, you all went to fight for South Vietnam mm. because if you didn't come to South Vietnam, and the North Vietnamese came earlier, we would have been in deep shit. Right. <laughs> so thank, yes, thank you for fighting for South Vietnam. So well, because, thank you. Our honor, yeah. sir. And I, I can I see are. the emotion in your eyes. I don't know if the camera's picking that up, but I know you mean no, this down from your heart. <laughs> my God. And, and, you know, I went, I went to the Vietnam Wall in 1986 when I had a break from Officer Cannon School, and I stood there, I looked at the wall, and I, I didn't know one name on there. And so part of my service to this country was to pay back for mm. all the things I've received, the freedom, the education, um, the opportunities. But then when we went to the Gulf War and came home in 1991, um, it was awkward in Southern California as a Marine coming back because the American people had switched 180 yeah. for all the mistreatment that you all had. They treated us coming home from a 42-day war in the Persian Gulf like we were like superstars 
it was awkward to, 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 to not walk out in Southern California and get a free drink, free meal. People brought their homes, celebrities came out, um, Jay Leno came in. It was, it was overwhelming, but in my heart I knew that uh, the American people learned to appreciate, and I think over the last 30 years, to come to appreciate our American Vietnam vets for all of your sacrifice, because it was a very difficult period. You know, you were young, young men, and then to deal with that after serving your country is uh, uh, just in incredible that uh, you all are sitting here today and still love this country like I do. And Mr. Peters talked about the different wars that servicemen often fought. It sounds to me like another one of the wars that was fought by each and every one of you was the war upon returning home, yeah. whatever that circumstance was. Um, Mr. Hayes, when were you in Vietnam? What was your job? And were you drafted or enlisted? I finished high school in Jacksonville right here, 1966. I uh, had a rough upbringing. Mom with six children in the house, and I was the oldest boy. Had to fill in for a dad, had to work the whole time I was in high school, and I said to myself, I'm not gonna quit high school, but when I do, I'm leaving home. I just can't fill in for a dad. The other half of my family lived in Rochester, New York. So after I finished high school, I caught the first Greyhound bus that same week, went to Rochester, New York, I stayed there two years before I got drafted by the Army. Mm. I was drafted, started out at Fort Dix, New Jersey. And you know, you go through your basic training in AIT Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And then Vietnam as a grunt soldier, which is an infantry foot soldier in the jungle. I, I always tell everybody, it's the worst year of my life. Let me tell you how bad things were. Six of us on helicopters, three on either side. The line of helicopters go out to the jungle, dropping you off. Everything you have is on your back. Your sea rations, your ammunition pouches, your canteens, your grenades. You're carrying a load on your back, and, and then you, you're in the jungle, and you're fighting the enemy. Things were so bad in the jungle, this is the truth. One of my comrades, who was out there with us, things were so bad, I actually saw him shoot himself in the foot to get mm. out of the jungle. That's how bad it was. Mm. You're sweating all day. We're moving through the jungle. A number of guys just passing out from the heat, just passing out. And you were saying, too, just trying to carry the water, because you're a big oh, guy, God. and oh, the God. water's heavy, right? Thank God I was a weightlifter. But we had five-gallon containers of water. Nobody wanted to carry that because you got all that stuff on your back and your own ammunition, but when you run out of water, you want to be the first to drink. Mm. So we just uh, had sympathy for the guys that passed out and carried extra things, and you had the big 90 millimeter recoilless we carrying, plus all the ammunition, M60 machine guns, a number of uh, ammunition boxes. So we're carrying tons of weight. And I think and all uh, of us listening to you right now, everything uh, that you are all saying, I mean, I know this sounds simplistic, but you probably maybe had the same thought. I don't even see how you survived and how you did that. And okay. one thing I wanted to point out to you, Mr. Newman and I have been at some of the schools, and I want to tell you all, we've been at, by the end of next week, we'll have been at 13 area high schools. These gentlemen have come, and they've shown the documentary with me. They've <laughs> shared their stories, and the students have stood up and given them standing ovations. They said they had no idea what you all went through. They didn't know how to respect our Vietnam vets. And you said something yesterday that I would like you to repeat. When you see a Vietnam veteran with a Vietnam veteran hat, what do you want people to do? When you, you see a Vietnam veteran, or you recognize them by their hat, don't say, thank you for your service. Tell us, welcome home, because that is the welcome home that we never got when we came home. Then say, thank you for your service. Mm -hmm. and we'll love you that much more. Oh, I love the smile on your face. And you represent a very important part, doesn't he, of this history? He does. Uh, a little inside information. I know a little bit about Mr. Newman's story. Unlike many of the grunts in terms of the Army service and the Marine service, you had a different sort of service. Can you tell our viewers where you were, what you did, and when, especially, you were there to be a first-person witness to a very historical event. Yes. I uh, 
enlisted in the Navy two weeks after I turned 17. Uh, I was a young teenager, the rebellious, and I needed two things. I needed discipline and role models. I found them both in the military. And uh, I knew by the time I got out of boot camp that uh, I was going to do tw at least 20 years, which I did. Uh, I served on seven different destroyers and several different uh, other duty stations. Uh, but the most famous uh, destroyer that I served on was uh, the USS Maddox. And I was there in 1964, August of 1964, during the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Um, I was had a bird's eye view of uh, North Vietnamese torpedo boats coming towards us uh, in a very high rate of speed, uh, 40 knots or better, in a figure eight patterns interweaving like this as they came. Uh, I remember just like it was yesterday, announcement from the commanding officer over our, the, the one MC saying that torpedo boats were approaching us uh, with intent to uh, uh, engage us in warfare. He said, when they reach a five mile limit, I'm going to fire warning shots over their bow. If they don't uh, stop, then we're going to engage. And which he did. Uh, so we, we actually fired the first uh, shots in the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Hmm. Uh, For the people who don't know, this is the actual event. This is the attack that prompted <laughs> Lyndon Johnson's famous Gulf of Tonkin resolution that obtained congressional authority for the United States to escalate the Vietnam conflict. So for Mr. Newman, was actually on the USS Maddox when that attack came in early August of 1964. Mr. Newman, what have historians or what have people gotten wrong about the Tonkin incident that you have been able to say, no, that's actually not true because I was there? Yes, that, that would be the second attack. Uh, after the, uh, the, our first attack on the 2nd of August, uh, mm -hmm. we went out into the Gulf and uh, replenished our ammunition and so forth. And we hooked up with the uh, Turner Joy. And went the following day, we went back into the uh, Gulf. And uh, that evening, we had been, we had people on board that were intercepting the communications from the uh, North Vietnamese. And there was some talk on the, in the communications that uh, they were going to uh, attack the destroyers again. So that evening and that night, it was so dark, it was overcast, it was stormy. Mm -hmm. uh, waves were pretty choppy. But I actually, it was so dark, I actually put my hand out like this here to see if I could see it and could not see it. That's how dark it was. Our sonarmen were not the best. Uh, sonars used, they send us a sound, a, a signal out under, in the water, and if it uh, hits a target, uh, say a ship or a boat or a submarine, that it will uh, bounce back uh, and they will pick that up. Well, they were picking up signals that they were interpreting as being boats. Uh, we interpreted that to mean uh, patrol craft or torpedo boats. Our radars were not working well, and especially in that type of weather. We, radar was not as developed back then in 1964 as it is today. It's more refined today. We were getting false uh, readings on our radar. 
that night, we we were getting, uh, at first uh, there were reports of uh, the torpedo boats were coming at us and so we opened up fire and we got reports of that evening of 27 different torpedoes launched. Now keep in mind a torpedo boat uh, only has two torpedo tubes. <laughs> <laughs> so, to have 27 uh, torpedoes fired at you uh, tells you that there's a tremendous amount of traffic out there. It was so dark, uh, we called in air cover, and we're battling. The Turner Joy is picking up their uh, false sounds also, and they were firing their guns. It's luckily we didn't kill mm -hmm. each other out there. Hmm. But the uh, air cover that we got were dropping flares. Even the flares, it was so dark, could not penetrate the darkness. So they could not even see if there was anything on the surface or uh, verify that there was actually anything out there. And so, Mr. Newman, um, I'm listening to all these details are fascinating deals because you, you are living history. You were there. And I think what Dr. Butler and I are trying to to let you explain is you for sure knew there was one attack on that yes, day in 1964. Absolutely. But the second attack that LBJ <clears throat> came out into the entire country and said, we've been attacked twice now. Yes. Do you think that happened? Uh, what happened was we were informing, there was a lot of messy traffic going from uh, Maddox all the way up to the White House. Now the message traffic that went to the White House before Johnson went before Congress said that it's very doubtful that there was an attack. Mm -hmm. That our sonarmen, what, what happened as a ship goes into a high speed turn, it creates a, a knuckle, an air knuckle. And they were pinging off of these air knuckles and reporting them as torpedoes. Our captain figured that out. And so the whole so, country thought that there were two attacks when there was really only there one was that only you were really involved one. in. Yeah. And so that just goes on and on about one example of the lies that came from the LBJ administration, right, Dr. Oh, Butler? Oh, it was and so, the first of many. And so I just wonder from all these veterans, I mean, well, you were there with your own lies, with your buddies, and you find out at some point that the government wasn't even honest about this war. So what are your feelings about that? Klaus? We, uh, we know that we've been lied to, you know, just alone on the body counts. All the body counts were lies. If you had, uh, if you say you, you killed uh, 10 enemy soldiers, we would, they would put down 20, you know. So there was always, the body count was always higher. We in this guy, we in this other Marine was sitting in, uh, on uh, security one night and we were talking about that. I said, you know, when you think the body counts, there shouldn't be anybody left in North Vietnam, you know, because of the, the body counts, you know, were so high all the time, you know. And, but our, our part of it was always, we were always saying, why can't we just line up and just go, you know, and just clean the whole house up? And, and that brings up a really good question. How many of you thought that, who screwed up the war? I guess that's my question. Who screwed up the war? Who didn't fight it the way they were supposed to? The politicians. 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 Go ahead, tell me what you think. They left us flounder. They, we didn't know what was going on. The country was in uproar. The yeah. Congress was lying to us. Uh, we were, it was just, it was mayhem. Well, let me explain the body count for those who may not know that. That was the way with the Lyndon Johnson administration to prove statistically that we were winning the war. Yeah. So if there was an enemy combatant killed, he was counted as part of the body count. And I think what Klaus is saying is the familiar refrain that if it was dead in Vietnamese, it was Viet Cong. Yeah. So you're saying you saw firsthand that the body count was another fabrication. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Wow. There was a lot of lies. When did you realize, or when did you first sort of imagine that the reason that I was told we are in Vietnam is not the reason that we're here? In other words, we've talked about the lies, and we've talked about you guys realizing that 
the country, the politicians, <laughs> Congress has sort of turned their backs or at least misleading you. Was there a time when you were deployed where you thought, this is not what I thought it was going to be? Klaus, well, you look like you were going well, to chime in. What we always thought was we were restricted for what we could do. Right. You know, if you were somewhere where nobody else was around, you could pretty much do what you want to do as far as killing field goals. But in other ways, like where I was as a combat engineer, if we took prisoners, we couldn't interrogate them. We had to turn them over to the South Vietnamese Army. So, and that was that problem. I had an incident where this, this Marine Simpson got shot, and I saw a Vietnamese person on the rice paddy dike, and I was with Dixon, and I said, Dixon, you see a gun on him? And he said, no. I said, come on, Dixon, look harder. You know, and I had my M14 up, and I was ready to, book, to, to bang this guy up, and uh, we couldn't find the gun, and I didn't want to shoot him, because first of all, I was a foreigner, so I figured if I shoot him, and then they tell me I killed somebody, and they're gonna throw me out of the, out of the military. So there was a lot of restrictions like that. You didn't have yeah. the free range what you should have, mm -hmm. you know? So you probably can verify that as far as that the South Vietnamese Army wanted to be always, you know, uh, informed on it. That's what happened right. in Way City. When the Way City War right. was on, the, the uh, South Vietnamese Army was at, at the Citadel and uh, they were told that the Marines were coming, so they left earlier. Right. So when the Marines went there, there was no South Vietnamese Army there, so they got ambushed by the North Vietnamese right away. Yeah. And you turn to Mr. Pham, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, so just for perspective, so the, uh, the Maddox incident was August 1964. I was born in September 1964, so <laughs> we're in the same AOR, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, when we came here as refugees in the mid-70s, there were a lot of confusion. So the kids in the neighborhood said, what are you doing here? You're Vietnamese. I thought you were the enemy. So mm. right away, the neighborhood kids didn't know oh, why yeah. we were all of a sudden in Southern California, along with the, all the other um, immigrants that uh, had arrived. I would meet some Vietnam vets uh, in the 70s, and at, at our school, there was no English for a second language. So the school thought it would bring a, a, an American Vietnam vet that had some Vietnamese training into the school. And he would say words like you would see in the movies, okay, GI, Coke, you know. <laughs> he would talk like that, Didi Mao, and it confused all the kids. <laughs> so after about two weeks, you know, that whole English is a second language taught by an American <laughs> Vietnam vet ended. So there were a lot of confusion in the community. Uh, but there were some American vets that in the beginning um, would ask me, are, are you from the South or are you from the North? And I wanted to have a card that said, I'm from Saigon. Yeah. I was on your side. You, you came to help us. Now, you, now you took us in. So I, I think the confusion was still not just in the history books of the politicians around the country. It was in the neighborhood. Um, in the mid '70s, America had a lot of things that America needed to fix. Right? Yes. Been in the war for a long time. There was a big recession, and then the Iran uh, situation. So you know, we we kind of got put in the back after the first few years, and then you know, more Vietnamese came out via boat, uh, and the big exodus really, you know, the millions that came out was not part of the fall of Saigon, only 130,000 came out. Uh, but now I think if you look back, uh, America really opened its doors for the, for the Vietnamese refugees. There are two million now in the U.S., if not more, and in Jacksonville, uh, I'm personally very happy to have 2,000 Vietnamese here and at least 10 Vietnamese restaurants. Yeah. <laughs> and I think what Mr. Kwan brings to the discussion is the realization that it was not Americans versus Vietnamese. It was not that cut and dry. As a matter of fact, we were there at the invitation of the Republic of Vietnam. The army that we were there supporting was Arvin, the army of the Republic of Vietnam. Those bombs that we dropped, as Mr. Kwan mentioned, three times more than all of World War II combined, those were dropped on our allies in South Vietnam, not even taking North Vietnam into the equation. So it really complexifies what it is that we teach and know about the Vietnam conflict as a whole. Now, when I asked about the lies, I could tell from combat, he had a very strong reaction. So I wanted to come to you and ask, when did you realize that you were being lied to about what was going on in Vietnam while you were there. When your commanding officer tells you you can't return a hostile fire, 
there's something wrong there. I mean, why can you not return a hostile fire? They're shooting it at us. They're coming towards us. Why can't we defend ourselves? We weren't allowed to defend ourselves. Oh, wow. And, you know, it's crazy. So do you blame the, the suits or the boots then? Well, you know, they blame the higher-ups. I mean, the yeah. higher-ups are in, in Washington, and they're running the war, and they're being fed false false information. It's a... Uh, it's, uh, you, and, and you being, me being a PFC, I mean, I wasn't privileged to any type of information like but only what we were told that you can't return a house of fire, you can't do this, you can't do that. But, you know, when they're trying to take your trucks, when they're trying to overrun your compound and stuff like that, what do you do? You can't just throw rocks at them. You know, you've got to defend yourself. I've never been lied to. Hmm. Listen to me. You're at home in the 60s, you're watching TV. You see those planes flying in, those caskets draped in flags yes. from Vietnam. You know a lot of people, soldiers are being killed every year. So I knew what to expect when I got to Vietnam, being an infantry grunt man, I knew what to expect. I just prayed to God that, you know, if I did my year in the jungle, I hope I can come home safe. I always said, God, if I get shot, please don't let me get shot in my neck and be paralyzed down. And please do not let me get shot in my private area. And, and I've already prayed about that. And I just, but like I said, my main thing was, like I said, I knew I was in the war as an infantry foot soldier out there in the jungle. I knew what to expect. And, uh, and like I said, we, the majority of us were 19, 20, and 21. Of course, you had a few older guys too, but the majority, uh, a lot of them had enlisted, but all those guys drafted like me, you know, we we're 19 and 20 years old. And so we knew what to expect. Uh, but, but like I said, that jungle for a whole year, sleeping in the rain, fighting in the rain, eating in the rain, crossing rivers, and waiting for hot choppers to come in and resupply you with stuff. Uh, and sometimes you get a little mail, you can put on the chopper, and they can mail it to your family and everything. That was the worst year of my life. And any job I get now is nothing compared to that. Mm. And I've had some tough jobs. Uh, Department of Justice working in the U.S. Penitentiary is the, the baddest guys around from killing people. It's nothing compared to the year I spent in Vietnam as a grunt. Mm. The average age of the American serviceman killed in Vietnam was 19 years old. Exactly. The average age for the American killed during World War II was 26. So that gives you a stark contrast in who fought these wars and who was put on the front lines during the conflict. Mr. Newman, I saw you perk up as well when you wanted to add a little bit more to the conversation that combat had started. Yeah, I, I think I had a, a moment of honesty uh, by our government when in uh, October 1966, the Navy came out with a uh, message that they needed 500 volunteers immediately to go to Vietnam. And of course, I raised my hand, and uh, along with a good friend of mine. And I was uh, in November, I uh, got a message in that I was accepted. I reported for duty in Mare Island in uh, 1966 on December 24th for three months of riverine training. The very first day, they had a huge auditorium. We were 500 of us we met there. Our new commander, they called him Dusty Rhodes, came into the audience and he looked out over us and he said, I'm here to tell you that a lot of you will not come back. He says, I'm giving you this opportunity right now. Anybody that does not want to go over to Vietnam, you can stand up and leave the audience and we'll cut you new orders. Not a single man stood up to leave. We all remained there. So that told me that one, we knew what we were getting into from day one. They did not lie to mm. us about it. And secondly, that all of us were going to be brothers. We were all going to go over to fight side by side on our river boats. And uh, I, I think that was the most telling of, of all of the times that I was over, over there. You have to remember a young sailor on a ship. We did not have any of the communications that they have today. Right. We didn't have newspapers yeah. delivered to us. 
We were spoon-fed information in the Stars and Stripes uh, newspaper, if we ever got it. They normally sent uh, usually five or six copies to the ship, and the officers got them. Oh, geez. They never filtered down. We didn't have any radios. Uh, they did pipe in music sometimes. That was it. And that kind of so, makes me wonder, like, and what you're describing is you just, you're doing your best every minute of the day and night, and you're not really sure overall what's going on. Is that the had, feeling you all had, too? Like, what, what am I doing and I don't even understand? Yeah. Well, my brother was in the Air Force, and after I got drafted and went to Vietnam, I said, God, why didn't I join the Air Force or Navy? <laughs> uh -huh. Join the Air Force or Navy, and you would not be out in the jungle like this. Everything you want is on that ship to eat. Those Air Force, they fly in, drop bombs, fly back to base, sleep in a bed at night. Bob hoping all those shows come over there, they dance at night. You get none of that in the jungle. <laughs> no, none of that. Well, I didn't get any of that either. I was only like 20 miles from the name. Yeah. Now, Klaus, you said that you were a combat engineer. You know, one of the things that yeah. we said from the very beginning is depending on where you were, when you were there, and what you did kind of dictated your experience in Vietnam. What did a combat engineer do? Well. I, I, I got there in 1967 and uh, in February. What we do is we sweep the roads, we build roads, we, we build bridges, we, we cut a path, whatever needs to be done. We repair things, we, we, we disarm mines on, on, the, on the roads. Sometimes you have to blow them if you don't know really what pin to pull to, in the, to, to make it safe. Wait, so, how did you find those bombs? Well, we used to go down the road. We had a point man like this, and we had two guys with a mine detector. The mine detector picks up metal. But a lot of the Vietnamese, um, not the, a lot of the VC. Um, the Viet Cong. The Viet Cong. The enemy. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't remember the enemy. The, the Viet Cong made some out of concrete or out with wood and stuff. So the, your metal detector wouldn't pick that up. So. What would happen is they wrap the stuff up in, in uh, big banana leaves, like, because when they transport it, you know, so the people don't catch it that he's got a bomb in there or something. Oh, wow. So they transport it. It's part of, you know, being camouflaged. Uh, and then when they put it in the ground, since the, the ground where we were was kind of like reddish clay, and um, so when they put it in, they didn't un unravel the, the, the leaves. So they stuck it in the ground like that. So as a point man, I was able to detect sometimes the different color in the, in the ground. And that made me uh, think there might be something there. So I took my bayonet out and I stabbed into it. And if it's only going so far, you know, you're not, you know, not doing hard, you're doing easy. And then we're just to put C4 on and blow it right there in place. And that, that brings up a point that you've made over and over is the ingenuity of the Vietnamese oh, yeah. was very high and superior in some cases. Oh, absolutely. And not only that, but a lot of the materials that were used in booby traps, a lot of the materials that were used to kill and wound our soldiers actually came from materials that we provided. Could you give us an estimation on how, on the ingenuity of the enemy that you saw? They used everything you threw away. If you threw anything away, they would pick it up and then make something out of it. Like the B3 can of the sea rations, a whole grenade will fit in there. So they tie that to a tree to put the grenade in there. I mean, first they put the tripwire on it, then they pull the pin on it. So when the point man goes through, he tripwires that, the grenade will fly out of the container and it goes off. They also do um, um, the, any unexploded uh, ammunition or anything, they mm. use that powder for everything. They also do, uh, uh, when I, I had to go down to uh, an area where they shot the rockets into the Nang Air Base. And when you looked at it, you couldn't believe, you know, like we have all this modern equipment to, to shoot rockets. They had like stove pipes mounted on wood and they would have a foxhole duck and the, and the guy would be in the foxhole with a battery and, and set that rocket off. But like I said, it was like a stove pipe and just a piece of wood. And they would have it staggered all over, and then they would have bamboo stakes for aiming stakes, you know, like we have, like colored ones, like with red and white lines on it. This would be just a plain bamboo stake, and they just go by that. And they, when they first, uh, first time ever uh, rocketed the Nang area, wow. 
So we had to go down there as combat engineers because we had to clear the area and make sure there was nothing booby trapped and everything. So that brings to the surface one of the things that I often tell my students, and that is we were fighting a conventional war against a very unconventional enemy. Well, even like for us, our mm -hmm. fuse lighter, when we set off explosive with, you know, because if you set it, that's what you do. You have an, you want to, you want to blow this up. So you put C4 underneath it, you know, on the sides and everything. And then, well, you can't light C4 because the C4 line is like explosive. It, it goes off. So mm -hmm. then you got to put a time fuse on it. So you put the time fuse on it. And the, in, the, in the time fuse, have a blasting cap. And it, you pull the pin back and, and then let it go. And this goes off. So you have two explosions. You have your, your uh, dead cord explosion. Then you have your main explosion. So, so when, you have a when you have one of those fuse lighters, they always tell you, once, once you get ready to explode it, take the fuse lighter and turn it around, put it next to the dead cord, so that gets blown up. The fuse lighter is the same size as a, one of a, a 30 out 6 round. You can put that in there and pull that pin back, and it'd be just like a gun. And they take that and tie that up to a tree with a tripwire. And, and all they have to do is break that tripwire. That pin goes home, hits that primer, boom, a round goes out. And that set it, you know, high enough, you know, for for us to get that. Uh, so one mistake is deadly. Yeah. So yeah, everything exactly. you one throw away, they they will use. We have, have shot uh, BC. Yeah. We have shot the Viet Cong, and they had our grenades and our belt around them. They had actually had our weapons wow. on them. Yeah. Mm. You know, wow. if they kill Americans, and there's nobody out there for them, they take everything they have on them. Sometimes they cut parts of them off. If guys, guys grunts would know about that, because oh, yeah. if you've been in the jungle, you'd know about that. Oh, yeah. And so you'd be surprised. They take everything they can, everything. The v Viet Cong are the Vietnamese communists. Yeah. And they were almost impossible to detect when they blended into the local villages. The conventional battles were typically fought between our soldiers and the NVA, which was the official North Vietnamese right. Army. They were identifiable, they had the uniforms, they had the entrapments, but the Viet Cong, you were hard, they were very, very hard, if not impossible, to distinguish from the local villagers. I now, have, a, I have yes. a story about the Viet Cong. So in the early 70s, during that post-1972, when there was sort of a ceasefire, uh, as a South Vietnamese kid, I was seven, eight years old, and um, we didn't know what a Viet Cong was because all they showed on TV, on either South Vietnamese TV or Armed Forces television, was American clips. Hmm. And one day, my father, who was in a major, had duty, and he said, we caught a Viet Cong, and he's kept at the brig. You want to go see what a Viet Cong looks like? Hmm. So I accompany my father. We go to the brig, which is the base jail, we go in there and they bring out this teenager. And in my mind, I said, he's a Vietnamese kid. He's a kid. He's barely older wow. than me. Mm. And for all those years, all we saw were bodies of the enemy when we saw footage. Uh, let me clarify with the viewers. I think Hollywood movies shaped a lot of how the American public at large saw the Vietnam War. And they saw Vietnamese as villagers or victims or the enemy. Well. My family lived in Saigon, which was pretty much shelter from the war besides the Tet Offensive in 1968, the Easter Offensive, and then the final assault. So when we saw footages of the North Vietnamese rolling in, in Soviet-made tanks, don't forget the Chinese and the Soviet armed the North Vietnamese Army yeah, with right. anti-aircraft around yeah. Hanoi, with top-tier tanks and artillery, a full-blown yet they never sent Soviet troops or Chinese troops to Vietnam to help the North Vietnamese. They, they sent that visor, but they did not send 500,000 Chinese or Soviet troops, which is the opposite of what the United States did in helping South Vietnam. And, and another thing that the Viet Cong did was they understood their enemy a lot better than I think we understood ours. And Mr. Peters had an experience where he actually met members of the Viet Cong, and they understood that our armed forces had racial divisions from within. So if you don't mind, Mr. Peters, can I ask you to share that experience with the viewers? Okay. Um, what happened was um, there was a period of time when 
I didn't have a tank to go to, uh, to be stationed on. And um, I had to go to Arvin compound and spend 30 days with them. And I was nervous about being in there because I knew no Vietnamese language or anything. So I had no choice. I had to go in there. So I went in there and in a way, the South Vietnamese already knew what I was going through. So they, they treated me with respect. And uh, first night there, um, all the soldiers were all around me. And I couldn't understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. And the other guy that had been there a while told me that they are protecting you. I said, mm -hmm. okay. So um, I got captured, uh, well, uh, halfway got captured. I went into the village to talk to this guy because he was in a wheelchair and he had no legs. And I'd go and hold a conversation with him. And um, this one particular day I went in and the VC were there. And his wife met me at the, at the entrance to the, the ville and said, uh, there's some people here want to talk to you. And I go, oh no, what did I do? And she said, no, 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 no. They just want to talk to you. I said, okay. So I went in and no joke. Two VC sitting there, and they started talking to me, asking me questions. Why am I coming across the bill? They thought I was a political officer. I said, No. If I was a polit political officer, I'd have bars or stripes or something on my collar. I'm enlisted. I said, I come in here to talk to this guy because he can't get out of his wheelchair, and he's, you know, he likes to talk to people. They said, Okay. And then they asked me why was I fighting Yankee Man's War, and mm. I told them I said I had no choice. I was drafted. They said no choice. I said yeah. I said the only choice I had was to go to Canada. And then I wouldn't be able to go home at all. So I figured doing this, I could maybe I could survive it. So at the end of the long conversation, they told me, okay, we see that you're not arrogant, but if you come across the road. Stop and wait a few minutes. If you hear a gunshot, don't come into the village. I said, okay. So, mm, well, but sure, the Arvins knew more about Vietnam than Americans did. Right. I'm gonna tell you something. We knew about the Arvins too. We had what you call Kit Carson. You know what that is, Kit yes, Carson? Yeah. We we we, 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 we took one of those and put it with our company so they could be a Kit Carson. They can you know take us out. Yeah. They'll be the point people and tell us where the enemy is and everything. So we knew about that. Well, and tell those, us what uh, Kit Carson is to make sure everybody uh, knows. Yeah. A, a Kit Carson is an Arvin person. Uh, we're fighting for the Arvins, we're fighting for South Vietnam, but we would recruit them over to our company because they knew the jungle more than we did because they lived there. And so they would guide us. And one thing I like about them, eight things that we didn't eat. We had what we call sea ration scrambled eggs. No American likes scrambled eggs in a can. <laughs> but those Arvins that we recruited, man, they would eat that stuff, right? They had so much, we give all that to them. But they, like I said, they knew the land because they yes. lived in, uh, you know, South Vietnam, and they could guide us and let us know where the enemy is, you know, where the uh, bunkers are, and all these things. So it was a knowledge thing for us to have them out there, tell us where the enemy might be before we walk into an ambush like we did, and get all shot up. I That's like the uh, translators in Iraq and Afghanistan. Oh yeah. Yeah, and you oh, bring yeah. up Afghanistan. We we briefly mentioned that before, but I have had so many Vietnam veterans tell me. We didn't learn anything from Vietnam, and no. we did the same blasted thing to the exactly. what? Go yes, ahead, Klaus. Exactly what I'm thinking, the same thing. That's, that's all I saw was the same problem. They did the same thing, patrols, shoot up everybody, keep going, come back to the same area, fight the same, same war again. It was, everything was right down to the T like Vietnam, in my opinion. And then when we retreated, that was the biggest joke, in my opinion, because I thought, who in the world ever has his enemy being safeguards to put your soldiers and, and civilians on it and get them out of there? Nobody. Did we ask the VC when we retreated from Vietnam to, to, to cover all the whole area in Saigon? So mm -hmm. why are we putting the people on planes? We didn't. You know, everybody came on their own. You know what I'm trying yeah, to say? Absolutely. I, I, you know, it's, it's like ridiculous, you know, it was bad enough the way we had to retreat out of Saigon and, uh, and the other areas, and we didn't have enough boats to take everybody in. But, uh, you know, I, I was literally crying when that day came, and I was crying when I saw the Afghanistan thing. I really was. 
because it was just too much for me to handle, you know. And I, and I think Combat had the same reaction when Jeannie asked the question. Um, did it, the exit from Afghanistan, remind you of what you know about the abandonment of Saigon in 1975? Well, I thought it was horrendous. I mean, why, why did we not learn something from Vietnam and then repeat the same thing 50 years later? I mean, it was, it was useless. I mean, the people were abandoned. I mean, we left all of our equipment there, stuff like that. I mean, it was, uh, how, it, I thought in my own mind, what a stupid move. I mean, you know, this country didn't learn a darn thing. You know, mm -hmm. well, we that's my opinion. But you know, we couldn't carry everything. Like we were talking earlier today, all the people in South Vietnam wanted to come to America. You can't take a whole country to America. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like Ukraine right now. We keep bringing the whole Ukraine to America. You can't do it. Uh, you know, the, the best time for us grunts in the jungle, they gave us a one week, what you call R&R, &R, oh, rest and recuperation. You can go to a lot of places. You can, uh, if you're married, you can go to Hawaii. Uh, you can go to uh, a lot of different places. Uh, Did you know Australia was uh, wouldn't let black, out, Yeah, sitting wouldn't, in Australia. Yeah, no, uh, Australia in uh, the beginning, they're about, they wouldn't let any blacks go to Australia yeah, yeah, yeah. in the United they, States but, government. But they, yeah, they, they, that's changed, true. they changed that, though. Yeah, uh, they there are about eight it, different yeah. places you could go to yeah. for that one week. But when that one week is up, you think about it, you say, maybe I should go AWOL because i got to go back to the jungle mm -hmm. to finish up the just two or three months i got <laughs> left. And that was the worst thing in the world, coming back. You know, wow. I went to Sydney, Australia for my one week, yeah. and I said, maybe I should go AWOL, because I, I got to go back to the jungle when I get back. And, and, and thinking some... about getting back, I mean, oh, I've had Lord. people tell me, now I know this is going to probably infuriate you, it would me if, it would me if I were in your shoes. I've had people say, hey, just tell those Vietnam vets to get over it. Mm. And that, and yeah. I'm not even a Vietnam vet, but yeah. getting the honor of knowing you and hearing your stories, that mm. infuriates That's me. And what, what do you yes. react to that when, when you hear people say that? Well, that, that, that they need to shut their mouth. They don't know. I understand where I understand where some of them are coming from. They say, uh, we're out here fighting. What are we fighting for? We're not gaining anything. We fight because they put us out here to fight. That's but right. what are we taking back to America with us? Nothing but dead bodies. Right. So I understood it when they said, you know, uh, we're out here in Vietnam and we're fighting. We help out the Arvins and South Vietnamese and we're losing our own soldiers, but what are we getting out of it? And yeah. right now, still the, the the problems that you still deal with. I mean, oh, you were open with me the other day. You were telling me about how many um, psychiatrists you've been to or therapy <laughs> sessions, and you mind sharing that? I mean, it's when you go to the VA and they talk to you. I mean, it's it's you you feel like a you feel like an idiot sitting there, and they want to show you cat videos and they want to tell you about this and that. But when we go to the high schools and we talk to these young people, mm. it's better therapy for us to be able to listen to these folks talk to us, ask us questions, and really uh, some of the questions are pretty deep and they really want to get in your head. And I, you know me, Janie, I, there's a couple of questions I, I wouldn't answer, but then I got to the point, well, I'm going to answer this question. And I know and, what question that is, and it's okay if you want to share that now. I mean, you guys taught me that kids should not ask you how many people you, you killed. killed, although combat decided what just go face to face with that right I went I just one question has been beating on me for 54 years I've been killing the same guy for 54 years mm. but they asked me what what's the worst how many people did you kill me being a, a sniper and with a machine gun I said well I'll tell you this I said when we got overran we were hit by I think we had a thousand NVA and 500 regulars hit our compound and we were overwhelmed. We were fighting them in and out, day and night, three, four days. I mean, the bodies were dropping. And this one time, uh, the one guy that had a machine gun next to me and I had mine, uh, we were, uh, we, 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 we got to a point where we, we, we were running out of ammo. And a couple of the VC broke through and Swede took out one and I had another one come up to my, my hole. And I pulled my machine gun back and I went like this and went click, click, I was out of ammo. And the, he, the VC, he turned around and he pulled that grease gun on me and he pointed right at my head and I said, I'm, I'm coming home. He went click, click, and I was able to grab him, pull him into my hole, and I cut him from his nuts to his nose with a K-bar. I pulled it right out and sliced him up. And I've been killing that same guy for 54 years. And, it's, and, and I told those kids that, and they, they said, oh, mm. man, that's, that's something. But they never, it never phased them to a point where they thought, oh, that was sickening or that was... But, it was him or me, you know, yeah. and it's happened. I, I don't know if any of you guys have had it. I'm sure you've had it. 
you know, that, but you know, you're in hard combat, you know, just like this gentleman here. You do what you got to do to 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 over you, adapt and overcome. That's it, Professor and Butler. Yes. Um, as we're wrapping up, um, my own study of the Vietnam War to reconcile what I saw as a South Vietnamese kid and my father, and as an American Marine, and grown up here. Um, when I go back and look at President Kennedy's inaugural speech, it, it, is, it set the stage. It sta he said, to bear any burden, pay any price, oppose any foe, support any friend at yes. any cost. Yes. And he mentioned Southeast Asia, yes. and he talked about communism. That was in 1960. You were all growing up during that time. You remember that speech. That set the stage. To bear any burden? To pay any cost? You know, what you're saying there, I think, my, my own personal opinion, I think if John Kennedy and Martin Luther King had not been killed, the whole country would have been a whole different, a whole different scenario. I don't think we would have been in Southeast Asia. I really don't, because Kennedy wasn't going to well, go. For, I, I think, to follow up on Jenny's question about what infuriates you, I'm going to ask it in another way. Mr. Newman, why do you do this? Why do you agree to be on panels where you talk about things that are traumatic and are going to stay with you for much longer than the cameras actually being on? Why do you go to schools and tell these stories over and over and over? I think it's important that they know our story. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're living history. That's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. We're like a book, except they can, we can, we're talking books. They can ask questions. Uh, and we can tell them our experience. It's hard for, especially in today's society, our young people to, if we can grab their minds and, and shape it and, and tell them what mistakes that were made during our era. And I, I like to tell them, you are our future leaders. Mm -hmm. Every one of you. Some of you, there will be some that will become Congress people, the senators out there, people that are gonna go into the media, uh, but they are our leaders of the future. They've got to understand, and they've got to make sure that they never make the same mistakes that were made during our era. That's and what's important And I wanna compliment all of you. I mentioned Absolutely. that we've been at the schools. By the time we finish before the end of the school year, we will have been at 13 local high schools. And one teacher made the comment, and it was so true. When we start showing the documentary, when students start listening to you, she said, you could have heard a pin drop. That was proof of respect. That's the kind of thing you're teaching these students, and you on the college level yeah. as well, the respect, because you can't really understand or respect anything that you don't know anything about. Awesome. And that's why I think you all have done such a splendid job here in our military community, sharing about Vietnam, sharing what you have been through. And so to kind of wrap things up on a positive note, um, I've heard you talk about the brotherhood that you all have, and oh. I'd just love for you to express that right now. I think He's we smiling. all share a common bond. Yeah. And uh, we've experienced the same thing. It's like being a police officer they share, they have a world that they live in and it's hard for them to talk to people outside that world. We're the same way. We, I understand combat's problems uh, is PTSD because I share the same PTSD. I say, I share the same guilt that he does of having a brother killed right beside him. I've, mm. I've experienced that <laughs> and I, although I, I was not in the jungles I was on the rivers and shared the same thing of living in, in that atmosphere so um, so I think it's important that 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 brotherhood can never ever be broken no. ever ever and we always tell everybody welcome home we don't say thank you for your service yeah welcome home, yes. welcome home. I'll check on combat probably sometime three or four times a week <coughs> if I know he's feeling bad I just something about the connection I know he's not doing I'll call him up how you doing combat what's going on 
You just know inside. I just know inside. a good man. I give him a call, he gives me a call. Uh, and I feel a special bond with the three Marines, oh, Semper yeah. Fi, but also <laughs> with the other <laughs> service members. Yeah. Because we were in Vietnam <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to welcome you home, and I want you to tell me welcome to America. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Well, I got along because with I've all. been welcome to America since 1975. Yeah. Okay. I got along with all young Vietnam vets in Vietnam, especially grunts. We're all going through the same thing. Mm -hmm. yes, what, yeah. And so yes, we, we all felt the same way, and uh, I felt no discrimination until I got back to the country. Yeah. So I tell you right now, I got along with every vet in Vietnam as a grunt out there because you know, you watch my back, I'm watching yours. You know, you use the bathroom in the jungle watching me and I'm watching you. You know, when we all go to sleep at night, we got to rotate for people to wake the other next one up around us. Right. And I got so mad one night because the guy didn't wake me up. And I said, God, you could have got us all killed by you not doing that. That, that teamwork is oh, critical. Lord. But it's, it's such everything. a joy, it's, it, it really is. I don't think, I shouldn't use the word joy when I speak about Vietnam, but it is such a joy to learn from you all. I mean, we've been listening to your stories and, and writing these documentaries and, and our broadcast stories for a year and a half, two years now, and there's so much still to talk about. But I wanted Dr. Butler to close since he's the you're the teacher, you're the professor. I get and, the final word. And he, right. and he is taking <laughs> students over to Vietnam again this year mm -hmm. so they can talk to a survivor of Mia Lai Massacre, so they can understand yeah. the really important part of our history. So thank, welcome home first, right, and then thank you for your service. Yeah. Welcome home to all of you, and I think one of the pr privileges of doing this is that as I read and about our veterans' experiences, not just here, but also in Vietnam, you guys have more in common than you think. Yeah. One of the quotes that I hold most dear about this topic came from a former member of the NVA. He is a novelist named Bao Ninh, who wrote The Sorrow of War. And this panel has reinforced something that I truly believe, and that is, in war, there are no winners or losers. There's only destruction. Only those who never fought like to argue about who won and who lost. So thank you, gentlemen, for sharing your experiences. Thank you, Jenny and First Coast News, for platforming these stories. And please understand that you are, as Mr. Newman said, living history. Yes. So thank you. Yes, thank, thank you very you. much. And stay tuned. We'll tell you a little bit more about how to see the documentary and spread it to our other schools. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for watching Voices of Bravery honoring the veterans of Vietnam beyond the battlefield. Voices of Bravery honoring the veterans of Vietnam is now streaming on First Coast News Plus, available on Roku and Fire TV. Would you like to schedule a Vietnam event at your school or group? First Coast News anchor Jeannie Blaylock and Vietnam veterans will come and present our documentary, Voices of Bravery Honoring the Veterans of Vietnam, and be available to answer questions. You can email Jeannie at jblaylock at firstcoastnews.com.